Good Monday morning, church. Pastor Paul here. You know, my mom always said, uh, what was she? Well, Karen Carpenter of the Carpenters was one of her favorite singers. And Karen Carpenter always said, you know, rainy days and Mondays always get me down. Well, when it's a rainy day and a Monday, what does that do? But we're not down here, are we? Nope. We are excited about being in the Word of God as we continue our journey through the book of Exodus. And we are all the way up to Exodus 11, so we're about a third of the way through this book. And just as a, as a bit of context here, we have been walking through the plagues. And these have not just been uh, a sign and wonder circus show that Moses is putting on. This is a high stakes duel to determine who is the greatest, whose, whose people has the greatest God. And what we've seen so far is the, the gods of the Egyptians are really no gods at all. And, but there's only one true and living God, Yahweh, who shows himself repeatedly powerful and mighty to save. And we are now in this 11th chapter, there, we hit a, a, an interlude, okay? Before the 10th and final plague, the most famous of the plagues, the Passover, there's, a, there's an interlude where we get, um, or the people of, people of Israel originally, the now us, of course, are getting a, a reassurance of the fact that God is absolutely positively in control of all of their circumstances. So let me read. It's a short little chapter, uh, chapter 11. We'll pray and then we'll get into it. Now the Lord said to Moses, yet one more plague I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that they ask, every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. So Moses said, thus says the Lord about midnight, I will go out in the midst of Egypt and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, you and all the people who follow you. And after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. And the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. Father, um, here at the dawn of this new week, um, we pray, Lord, that you would give us a fresh vision of yourself. That's what we need the most, whether we know it or not or feel it or not. We need to be reminded constantly and rehearse constantly who you are and how we can fully and completely entrust ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's get a little context here, okay? A lot of times um, when we think about the, the books of the Bible, and this particularly relates to the New Testament, we, we put a great emphasis on context, right? Who was Paul writing to or Peter writing to? And what was the, the time and the circumstances and what problems were they addressing? And But we, we oftentimes fail to apply those same um, interpretive keys and tools to the Old Testament because we have to remember that the Old Testament stories did not just appear out of thin air. They're not Aesop's fables. They're not, um, you know, uh, the farmer's almanac of, of, of interesting facts. They are, in fact, stories that were written down in a particular time in a particular place um, for a particular purpose. 
and such is the case with the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, which we believe were written by Moses. Now, when Moses wrote Genesis, he was he was writing, he was compiling Genesis, okay, for the first generation of Egyptians, I'm sorry, of Israelites who had come out of Egypt and were wondering about where they were going and who they were and where did they come from. And, and Genesis um, was given to that first generation of Israelites. Well, Exodus was most likely given to the second generation of Israelites, those who were wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years, okay? This was while their parents, okay, were dying off in the wilderness as punishment for not trusting God to go into the promised land. And they too were having their own set of questions, right? They wanted to know, why are we wandering in the wilderness? How did we get here? What, what, what was our relationship to Egypt? How did we come to be in Egypt? Um, and, and they were facing these sorts of questions. And so Moses pens Exodus under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to give them a sense of where they've come from, who they are, um, but also and primarily to exhort them to trust God. Will they trust God in the midst of their wilderness wanderings? Um, is God with them? Is he in control? Is he faithful? And the answer that we see over and over and over in the book of Exodus is yes. Um, God is not just with them, okay, as things are happening, but in fact, God is making things happen, okay? So, so in other words, God is not just responding to the things, the circumstances that they find themselves in, the troubles in the wilderness, the hunger, the thirst, the attacks from enemies, disease, snakes, all those sorts of things. He's not just, he's not just responding to those things, but he's also actually in control in orchestrating the whole set of events. And this was to inspire them to trust God, right? That they can trust God regardless of the circumstances, okay? God is making things happen as a part of his redemptive plan. Now, chapter 11 functions in this way to get the Israelites to look back on these plagues and to see that the hand of God was with them and was planning for them even 40 years prior, okay, to their, to, to, and these were just children at the time, right? Or not yet born, but God was already planning for their good even before they were born, even before they knew they needed God. And we see this in the way that um, the Israel people of Israelites interacted with the Egyptians before this 10th and final plague when they are released. Now, as we read this text, it's interesting to note what we, what we can see is a, a really a great disconnect between Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. I'm not talking about the Israelites. We're talking about Pharaoh and his subjects, right? The Egyptians. Um, you know, here we have the Pharaoh. You know, Pharaoh is hardening his heart, refusing to let the people go under like the most dire of circumstances and plagues. But the people of, of Egypt, for example have great respect and awe for Moses and the people of Israel. And, and we can assume part of this is, is to do with the fact that Moses, I'm sorry, as Pharaoh, as the, as the most powerful man in the world, in the country, um, was in many ways insulated from the very plagues um, experienced by the Egyptians in a way that they were, you know, he did not experience them the same way they did. He had people to dig his wells. He had people to clean his the frogs and the locusts, and you know, he had he had people to um, to attend to his every need, which kind of mitigated the impact on him. Um, but you see this great disconnect um, between the way Pharaoh was experiencing the plagues and way the people of Egypt were experiencing the plagues. It re, you know reminds us of the French Revolution. Marie Antoinette, what did she tell them when told that the people of France were starving? infamously let them eat cake right they don't need grain <laughs> they don't need real food let them eat cake and and here we see this same sort of dynamic at play when the egyptians um, are interacting with the israelites now in chapter 11 god tells the israelites to speak to the people of egypt and to essentially um loot or i'm sorry to plunder the egyptians right 
um, to to ask of them, uh, you know, to give them these the Israelites all of their gold and jewelry and see and silver and food provision as they prepare to leave the land of of Egypt. Now remember, this was not looting, as we sometimes hear that term plundering the Egyptians. We 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 think that Israel was going around stealing all these jewels and gold and food and supplies from the Egyptians before they headed out, but not at all. This was a matter actually of of God giving the people of Israel favor in the sight of the Egyptians, okay? And we have to say, well, what was Israel going to do with all of these treasures? It seems a little superfluous, right? Um, well, a couple of things. One, we know that as the Israelites traveled, there was going to be needs for two million people, right? Um, uh, there was going to have to be bargaining chips with other nations. There was going to have to be provisions for trade. Now, we know that God was providing manna uh, from heaven, right? We, we, we know that was the case, okay? But, but there was other needs. But I think the primary need, okay, was going to be when God called them to construct a tabernacle, a tent of meeting that was going to be um, ornately decorated, they were going to need to need materials and supplies, and so we have to ask, where did Israel get those? Okay, where did Israel get these riches, these treasures to construct this tabernacle to worship Yahweh? Well, of course, they got them from the Egyptians, right? And and so all so in recounting this story about how God gave favor to the people of Israel um, in the sight of the Egyptians, it's a reminder, okay, to the to the Israelites. You know what? Before you even knew me, I was preparing for your provision. I was giving you the things that you would need to worship me. I was giving you the things that you would need that you didn't even know you needed, okay, to, to be provided for by me. I, I've been here the whole time. I've been guiding. I've been protecting. And, and what a great lesson and reminder for us, right, to know that God is not just with us today which he is, but in fact, God has been preparing the way for us long before we even knew that we needed him, even long before we even knew what the needs of today or this season were or are. God is sovereign, and it's an invitation to the people of Israel and to us to trust him, that God is not surprised by, for example, the current political climate in our country, or... Um, the ravages of a pandemic or the political civil unrest across the globe. God, God's not surprised by this. In fact, we can say that God is the sovereign hand behind all of these things, orchestrating all these things so that the people of God might trust him, might know him, might look to him, might follow him, might place their faith in him. And so, we can really, so the Egyptian, I mean, so the Israelites in going back and understanding the circumstances that preceded their exodus from, from Egypt can come, can come to understand that, that God is faithful in what he promises. He told them he was going to give them a land. He told them that he was going to lead them as a people. And they can now see how this was in the mind and heart of God long before it was obviously in theirs, right? Um, and so in the midst of all of this unrest, the plundering of the Egyptians, God makes this promise, okay, that, that Israel will be um, protected from this tenth and final plague, that God, in fact, will pass over them, not because they are more worthy, but because they have a mediator um, on their side. And we're going to find out more about that um, tomorrow morning. Same time, same station, Exodus chapter 12. But today, let's trust that God has already foreseen the ways in which we will need him and has, and has moved and is moving now to provide for them in ways that we cannot even imagine. So what an invitation to come and trust him today. Let's pray. Lord, let us again look to the example of the Israelites and your work with them to know you will never leave us or forsake us. It doesn't mean that we will be shielded from physical harm or shielded from trial and circumstance, but rather we know that you're in the middle of it 
rather that you are behind it, you are directing, you are divinely orchestrating, and that because of that, we can trust you. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, thanks, everybody. See you tomorrow.